everybody here and see everybody online. Praise God. Welcome, everybody, to Truth on the Web Ministries and Church of God at Woodstock's Weekly Sabbath Sermon Series. So, as it says here, we're going to do the gospel according to Nehemiah. So, actually, this is going to kind of center around Nehemiah, cha Nehemiah chapter 9, which is a prayer. Um, I actually don't think Nehemiah is the one that spoke it. I think it probably was Ezra, but it's in the book of Nehemiah, so that's fine. It could have been Nehemiah. doesn't really say specifically. Nehemiah was doing some talking during that period of time, but it seems like Ezra was the main mouthpiece. So in the book of Ezra, it doesn't really mention this particular prayer. It just mentions that they observed the Feast of Tabernacles, which this happened right after that on the 24th day. So um, I'm not going to dig into every single verse. There's 38 verses in this chapter. I'm not going to dig into every single verse. But actually, I think it's a really good prayer. And so uh, I want to go ahead and read it all into the record. So instead of me reading it, I actually found a nice little rendition of it by Alexander Scorby with read-along words on YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and play that instead to start off. And then, uh, and then we'll go back, and I'm not going to reread every verse. I will reread a couple of them, but most of them not. So, And we'll dig into it. So I'm just going to play this video here. It's almost eight minutes long. So please just, I'm going to have to mute the sound here. Chapter 9. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloths and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites, Jeshua and Benai, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sheribiah, Benai, and Kenani, and cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua and Cadmiel, Benai, Hashabniah, Sheribiah, and Hodijah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God for ever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou... Even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshippeth thee. Thou art the Lord the God, who didst choose Abram, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gavest him the name of Abraham and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and madest a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it, I say, to his seed, and hast performed thy words, for thou art righteous, and didst see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and heardest their cry by the Red Sea, and showedst signs and wonders upon Pharaoh, and on all his servants, and on all the people of his land. For thou knewest that they dealt proudly against them. So didst thou get thee a name, as it is this day. And thou didst divide the sea before them, so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their persecutors thou threwest into the deeps, as a stone into the mighty waters. Moreover, thou ledest them in the day by a cloudy pillar, and in the night by a pillar of fire, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandedst them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant, and gavest them bread from heaven for their hunger, and broughtest forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promisedst them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hadst sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly, and hardened their necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not 
Yea, when they had made them a molten calf, and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt, and had wrought great provocations, yet thou, in thy manifold mercies, forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manna from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness, so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations, and didst divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sihon, and the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Their children also multipliedst thou as the stars of heaven, and broughtest them into the land, concerning which thou hadst promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subduedst before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gavest them into their hands, with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities, and a fat land, and possessed houses full of all goods, wells digged, vineyards and olive yards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat, and were filled, and became fat, and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient, and rebelled against thee, and cast thy law behind their backs, and slew thy prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. Therefore thou deliveredst them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them, and in the time of their trouble when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies thou gavest them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned, and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and many times didst thou deliver them according to thy mercies, and testifiedst against them, that thou mightest bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly, and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them, and withdrew the shoulder, and hardened their neck, and would not hear. Yet many years didst thou forbear them, and testifiedst against them by thy spirit in thy prophets. Yet would they not give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the land. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keepest covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all thy people since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure. And we are in great distress. And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. All right, let me switch back over. <coughs> I had a reader for a moment, yes. So, and, and actually, I, I should have put it up first, so I had a slide for it, too, so. <laughs> so. 
So um, I, 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 I love that. We'll, we'll dig into Acts chapter 7 a little bit and Acts chapter 17 a little bit throughout the message. But I find it so a lot of what his prayer here is similar to what Stephen preached in Acts chapter 7 to the Israelites. They, they knew so they knew the history. Um, however, only the highlights of it. Um, actually devoid of any of the history of Israel itself did Paul use when he was preaching on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. So he mentioned God that made everything, and, and, and but he didn't go into that level of detail. So I find it interesting. But I, I think it's a wonderful prayer. There's a, We'll go over, but it's worth reading into the record in its entirety and in its context. So now we'll dig in. I'm going to skip over several verses and then dig into some more some of the verses more specifically. So we'll start with uh, chap- verse 2. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. I assume I, that it's a sound good. I didn't. Can I meet me real quick there? Test. Test, test. We're good. Okay. I should have done that earlier. Thank you. Very good. So Nehemiah chapter nine, verse two, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And we see similar information in the New Testament that we're encouraged to do in second Corinthians chapter six, verse 17. For example, Paul tells the believers, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. And he's quoting from the Torah there. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 4, we read, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And then we read one more verse here in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Paul writes here, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So this this verse and others as well kind of put a little bit of a different light on, if we just went from Nehemiah, it would seem like we should all go make some compound out of the middle of nowhere and not have separate ourselves completely from society and have our own little, little commune. But the New Testament makes it clear that that is not the case. We are to be separate as far as we are not to be entangled in any spiritual manner whatsoever with the world but we are not to seclude ourselves from the world because then we could not be, as he says here, a light unto the world if we just went and hit off somewhere. So there's going to be a theme you're going to see where there are very important principles that Nehemiah hit on in this prayer or that that were hit on in this prayer in the book of Nehemiah. But we're going to see that they all kind of miss the mark a little bit. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying Nehemiah or Ezra, whoever did this prayer, did anything wrong. Or did they drop the ball whatsoever? Because they did not. They did not whatsoever. They were very faithful men. Let's take a look at a few more verses out of that prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9. We're going to just briefly review verses 9 through 11 and 15. And I'm just going to compare these to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Because essentially that's what they are. They were the ones where it was talking about he did this and this and they did this and they did this. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. I'm not going to reread the ones from Nehemiah 9. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all brothers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So that's right. That's just one slide there. So real quick here, I just want to emphasize again that Nehemiah talked about God being with them and God working wonders and miracles amongst them and taking care of them and and not only just taking care of them, but caring for them and, and being, you know, overt in his care for them. But here, as we read, Nehemiah didn't quite understand or the people in the time of Nehemiah didn't understand who that really was that was with them, not in the fullness. They knew it was God, certainly. They knew he was the Savior of Israel. They knew he was the one that they they should worship. 
but they didn't know in the fullness that we know now, as Paul writes here, that that, that rock actually, that was Christ that was with them in the wilderness. I will brief, briefly review verses 16 through 21. And this kind of just goes right on where Paul t picks up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 13. I've got 6 through 9 on the screen here. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now they be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. That's an interesting statement Paul makes there. He's like, hey, look, the thing, the fullness of time has kind of come around. It's the time of the Gentiles now. Paul is writing here. So he's saying, look, the, a lot more has happened since this was written. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So essentially, Nehemiah was, or the prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9 was saying the same thing that Paul was saying there. He was, he was reciting things that God had done for the people of Israel. But when we read Paul's rendering of it, he puts a different light on it. He says, look, those things were, weren't just written because they wanted to say a prayer, or they weren't just written because they need to have some kind of record of it written down, but they were written for us, for our admonition, um, for our examples, so that we can be aware of the pitfalls that can exist in the life of the walk with God. I'm even going to more briefly summarize several more verses out of Nehemiah chapter 9 here, just saying verses 22 through 25, 27, 28, 30, and 31, essentially talk about God's mercy and blessings. Verses 26, 28, 29, and 30 talk about Israel's disobedience. And in conclusion, verses 32 through 38 um, express contrition and a petition for God to come back and forgive them and have mercy upon them and bring them back into the land. And the last couple verses um, in there, I'm not going to emphasize this anymore, but it said, he ended it up at the end of that prayer. Behold, we are, this is starting in verse 36. Behold, we are servants this day and for the land that thou gave unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. Behold, we are servants in it. And it yields much increase unto the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. And that fact never changed. They essentially were under occupation by one army or another up until the time that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and they were scattered. So that fact, and, and actually this prayer isn't asking them, isn't asking God necessarily to take that yoke off of them. He's just asking here, look, this is our state, so have mercy upon us. We don't have any power over this. All the land that you gave us because of our sin, we lost it, and now others are reaping the benefit of it. And not only that, we're their servants. And so the work that we do, just like it said in Deuteronomy 28, it's like the work that we do, they reap the benefit of, and we just get the scraps. So certainly, again, I don't want to ever give the impression that um, the men that came out of Babylon, uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, the other men dropped the ball, that they missed it. They, they were very faithful men. They were very faithful to what God had given them to do, and they, they worked with God's power, and they glorified God in what they did. But they just didn't have the whole story. They worked with what they were given. Let's take a look at a little more detail, although I will skim through these verses. We're going to skip back now and start digging in more deeply into the remaining verses. 
So verses 3 through 5, and this is a, a kind of excerpts from that whole set of verses. And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law and confessed and worshiped the Lord their God, then stood up upon the stairs of the Levites and cried unto the Lord, then the Levites said, Stand up, and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So I want you to think back to when I played that video. So it was about eight minutes long. So I don't know how many of you, your attention drifted during that time. I mean, we're sitting down watching the video, so it can happen. But if we read in depth of what was going on in Nehemiah here, I mean, they were every day for like three weeks plus, they were getting together. They were reading, the, the law was being read to them for hours a day. They were, not only were they enduring it, they weren't enduring it, they were enjoying it. And it was piercing their heart, right? Yes. So, so we only endured, you know, eight minutes or so of just sitting. And we think about in Acts chapter 20, where Paul preached late into the night and the guy fell out the third story window and, Paul had to raise him from the dead. And we think somehow, wow, that's rough. But we have it quite easy here. Quite easy. You had nice comfort. I got like a nice water. You guys online don't know it, but I got a nice little sermon fan behind me here that keeps the <laughs> climate nice and cool. It's very comfortable. So so here in, uh, in this prayer from verses, um, verses 3 through 5, we see that it was the Levites. Ezra was one of the Levites. They were exhorting the people. They were encouraging the people. Um, they were glorifying God. So let's take a look in the New Testament here, because certainly that happened in the New Testament as well. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. It says here, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So, and John is a Levite. So this is very similar. Israel's doing it. Now, how many were actually there? It seems like there were a lot of people. I mean, word was getting out. It went on for a fair while. Um, so a similar type of revival that we saw in Nehemiah in chapter 9. The people are hearing God's voice through this man, this Levite, John the Baptist. And they are confessing their sins. He also, at the same time, later on in that same chapter, skipping down to verses 7 and 8, and preaching, saying, There comes one mightier than I after me, the latchet whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So again, he's glorifying God, and he's saying, Look, I'm not the one, the same as the prayer in Nehemiah we read. They weren't trying to glorify themselves or lift themselves up. In fact, just the opposite. They were in sackcloth and ashes, and they were heaping contrition upon themselves. Oh, I forgot the video, huh? Very good. Thank you, Ken. We're back. So, so just as that example, so there's many similarities, but at the same time, there's more information available here in the Gospel of Mark than was available <laughs> In Nehemiah, it then was available to the people in the time of Nehemiah, and that is available if we just read Nehemiah and try to create doctrines based on only what the book of Nehemiah says. Acts chapter 2, verse 14, a similar occurrence here. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Skipping down to verse 32. That Jesus hath, Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. And down to verses 36 and 37. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And if we read down a few more verses, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you and to your children 
and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Again, others a similar, if you read through Acts chapter 2, Peter um, mentioned several historical events that had happened throughout Israel's history as points of contact for his message so that the people could identify with the message that he was bringing about, just the same way that the prayer in Nehemiah was. But there's much more information here. There's much more. And what is the information? It's the fact that Jesus Christ has come now. And that is in it, it is in him. So all Peter did, just as the prayer in Nehemiah, was that he preached to the people and he put their sin in front of them. And it was Peter's sin as well. So Peter wasn't pointing his finger at anybody. He was saying, look, we've done this, just like the prayer in Nehemiah. We did this. Our fathers did this. We sinned. We turned from them. We haven't obeyed them. But God is merciful and he is gracious. And in the time of Nehemiah, God had brought his people Israel out of captivity in Babylon back into the land to help set them back up. Here, something much more important had happened, and we'll dwell into that more. But again, the point I'm trying to emphasize mainly here is that if you, there there are many wonderful things that you can get out of the prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9, but if you stay there, you're going to miss a whole lot. And it's not because they missed it. They didn't miss anything. They worked with what God had provided to them at the time. Let's take a look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preserves them all, and the host of heaven worships thee. So again, he's identifying the God that they're praying to as the one that made everything. And the one that all the earth worships, whether they want to or not. But let's take a look in Acts chapter 17 here. This is Paul when he's talking to pagans, people who didn't know anything necessarily about Israel's history or what had happened in the wilderness. But he says a similar thing here in Acts 17, verses 23 through 24. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declaring unto you, God, that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. So here, God still is identified as the one that made everything. There's only one God that could do that. This is the God that he's talking about. Um, in Acts 4, verse 24, Peter says a similar thing. I don't have a slide for it here. When he's talking, he says, and when he's talking to the people that had trying they're trying to interrogate him he says and when they heard that they lifted up their voice to god with one accord and said lord thou art god which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is that's actually a fairly common recurring theme throughout scripture that identifies who he is a little more information paul gives us in colossians chapters 1 verses 16 through 20 paul says here for by him jesus were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, the Son, should all fullness dwell. And having made peace, through the blood of his cross, by him, the Son, to reconcile all things to himself, the Father. By him, the Son, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So here Paul gives us a whole lot more information about that God that made everything. And if we just go with what we read in Nehemiah, then we don't realize that there is God the Father and God the Son. Because that had not yet been revealed to them. Let's take a look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll skip down to a couple more verses here. In the beginning, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Skipping down to verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, 
and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So again, the, whether, whether, Nehemiah, whether the, the author or the speaker of Nehemiah chapter 9 understood in fullness what he was preaching, he was preaching that the word was made flesh and would come amongst his own and they would reject him. Now, whether they understood that or not, we don't know. But we can say that that is in there. From our point of view, we can look back and see that. But if we stay confined to what is in Nehemiah only, then we're going to miss the most important parts. Let's take a look at another prophet, Isaiah chapter 45, verses 18, and then we'll skip down to 22 22 and 23. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens and God himself that formed the earth and made it. He has established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. And skipping down to verses 22 and 23, we see, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth and righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. And Paul makes it very clear who was talking and who was being talked about. And Paul makes it very clear here and in many other places in the New Testament that the authors of the New Testament flatly believed that Jesus was God, had always been God, would always be God, that he was not an angel or some other type of being or someone that had um, been so good that he got promoted up to godhood or whatever whatever version of that it might have because it's going on. I mean, there's people out there now that there's a lot of stuff going on where people are getting pulled away from Christ. And one of the things that's confusing people is they'll say, well, Jesus never said, I am God. And he didn't say it in those words. There's no verse where it says, where Jesus says, I am God, not specifically. John 8, he says, you know, before Abraham was, I am. There are many verses that obviously mean that, but people take that and then they twist it and say, see, it's the believers. And, that, and that's one of the main things that the Muslims have is they accuse Paul of being a heretic and that Paul was the one that went around and spread all this blasphemy about Jesus, that Jesus never said he was anything more than a prophet and that he was a prophet of Allah. That's what the Muslims say. So, and this is more and more happening because if you remove if you remove Jesus' divinity, then he just becomes a man. Even if he's an important man, he's just another man amongst history, amongst a whole bunch of other important men. Right, exactly, yes. Yes, right. Man. And we're going to, that's a good segue. We'll, we'll talk about that. I actually don't have that verse in there, but yes, the same, same basic idea. There are many places where it's obvious that if, if Jesus is not God, then the authors of the New Testament are guilty of heinous blasphemy all over the place, all over the place. So here Paul, Paul makes it clear that what Isaiah said, which was connected to the prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9 by the fact that they said it's the God that created everything. Well, who created it? Well, Christ created it. God the Father through the Son, and everything was created by him and for him. And who will, who will all the world bow before and whose name will they confess? The one who made everything, who is Christ Jesus. So let's take a look here in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll skip down to verse 8. So God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to, unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, that he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So there's a number of things going on there, but essentially the author of Hebrews is telling us, look, before he's spoken us by his prophets, um, by the fathers, before the prophets were, but now in these times he's spoken to us by his son, 
Jesus Christ. So the same thing. So Nehemiah was amongst the prophets. He was during the time of the prophets, and that was the information they had. But we have more now. And also here, the author of Hebrews says that he made the world. So that's just another confirmation that's talking about Jesus. And he is the brightness of his glory. So again, there's only one that deserves glory, and that's God. Moses' faith shone with glory, but that was the glory of God that shone. It wasn't Moses' glory. There's no human being or any other being whatsoever, that, and not a created being, that is worthy of receiving glory. Only God. God says that he is a jealous God, and if we give glory to any other, then that's idolatry. doesn't mean we don't reverence people. But as far as glory goes, as far as, wow, that's amazing what was done. God is the only one. And then skipping down to verse 8, he says, But under the sun, he says, thy throne, O God. So here's just another verse that makes it clear that the New Testament says Jesus is God. So if you want to reject Jesus as being God, you must reject the entire New Testament. So don't go down that road because that is a road that leads to destruction. You will throw away your only hope for salvation if you follow that path. So if anybody tries to tell you or convince you that Jesus is not God, was not God, and always will be God, turn away from them. If you don't have an opportunity to convince them of their error, don't listen to them whatsoever. Another aspect of this also. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, What was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. So here, and we'll read one more verse there, it's clear that this, whatever happened, was before the foundation of the world. It wasn't at Calvary some 2,000 years ago. That was when it happened here. But this goes way back before. When did this glory happen? When did this... When did he have this glory? Let's take a look at Hebrews 4, verses 2 through 3. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Again, before this thing even started, before creation was even created, this was already set in motion, the whole before anything happened. So the covenant of the son coming here and dying for the sins was all set in motion and already all decided on before anything was ever even created. And that's why in John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus can pray this here. O oh, now, and now, O oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Because he was with him before the world was. We read that in John chapter 1. There was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. He dwelt among us. So, I want to point that out also. So the prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9 talks about making a covenant with Abraham. We'll look at that a little more detail here. But this covenant here that happened before the foundation of the world far predated that. So there was nothing that could have happened in regards to Abraham that would change what had already been foreordained and decided before the foundation of the world. That while the covenant with Abraham is important, the more important covenant is the one that was made before the foundation of the world. And we don't, and if you read the Old Testament, we don't get a very deep glimpse into that, that that had happened. It focuses more on covenants that he had made here and the importance of them, and they certainly were important, 
But if we just look at trying to find the gospel in the Old Testament, there are certainly pieces of it, and it certainly all points forward to the gospel. But the gospel from the Old Testament is incomplete. If it weren't incomplete, then Paul wouldn't have to, as we read in Acts, go into the synagogues and try to convince them that Christ is the one. Christ is the one that had to suffer and die for our sins, that Christ is the one that God has glorified and raised from the dead. I think there's a an idea somewhere that thinks that God has somewhat tied his own hands by making covenants throughout history, throughout human history. And he's made many covenants. He made the covenant with all mankind with the, you know, after the flood, with the rainbow being the token, that will never flood the earth again. He's made covenants with individuals and with nations. He's made covenants um, through Abraham to the entire world. He's made many covenants. And he certainly is a God of covenants in the sense that that shows his character, that what he says he will do. But I think people have the idea that those covenants are the most important ones. No, the most important thing is that before the foundation of the world, they decided how it's going to unfold. That's the one that matters. Everything else is just kind of leading up to that. And all, everything else is for us just an example and an admonition to point to the real thing that matters, that before the foundation of the world, the Father and the Son took sweet counsel together. And far beyond any kind of human reasoning, we could never think of as much destruction as we do to each other and as much as we blaspheme him and, and, and make a mess out of everything, he still decided, oh, I'm going to do it anyway. So... Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So even back in the Torah, so we don't know everything, but what we do know, that's what we need to stick to. We read in Hebrews where it's clear at different times throughout human history, he has dealt differently with mankind. Most lately, he has dealt with us through his son. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Skipping down to verse 12. For, we now see, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now in part, but then shall I know even as I also am I known. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 here. John tells us, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, we don't really know what it's going to be like on the other side of, of resurrection and eternity, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, or we shall see him as he is. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, and I actually have the, the New Living Translation version here, because I think it's actually a little easier to understand. It doesn't contradict what the King James says, but those set of verses are a little, I think this um, does it fairly good justice. I'm not recommending the New Living Translation in toto, but this is a pretty good group of verses here. So this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. So, again... They didn't know everything. We don't know everything now. So I want to caution people, certainly, that if you think that you've got everything figured out and you're trying to make plans as a result of that, you're in trouble. They didn't. And we're going to get into that a little bit more here in a minute. But uh, the fact is that the men who wrote the New Testament, the apostles and the other saints of that time, they knew more of God's plan than the prophets of old did. That's the way God did it. It's not a knock on it. It doesn't mean that the prophets of old were stupid. It is not a sin to not know everything. Jesus Christ himself didn't know everything. He didn't know when, when the 
father when the end was going to be. So if it's a sin to not know everything, then you're accusing Christ of sinning. So it applies to us also. So before I move on, just to make sure I got that point made here. So I just want to emphasize again that we can certainly not use it as any kind of excuse to sin or to fall short or to be inactive in our walk with God. But at the same time, we have to understand that we only know what God has given us to know, that we don't know everything, and that if we... um if we, in our pursuit of thinking we need to know some esoteric piece of information, follow off the path, we could be in real trouble and we might drag other people with us. And we certainly don't want to do that. Let's take a look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 through 8. Here Nehemiah says, Thou art the Lord, the God who did choose Abram and brought him forth out of Ur the Chaldees and gave him the name of Abraham and found his heart faithful before thee and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Girgashites to give it, I say, to his seed and has performed thy words for thou art righteous. So again here, it's clear that God made a promise to Abram and God made good on that promise. And it was a pretty tall promise. I mean, it took hundreds of years to fulfill. In fact, the, the land that God promised wasn't even really filled with those people yet. Some of those people were in there. But by the, when it was time to fulfill the promise, it was no problem whatsoever for Israel to go in there and assume the land that God had promised to them. So this speaks very highly of God's faithfulness and of Abraham as well. And also it mentions the covenant, as I'd said that God is a God of covenants, but it more it's not, it's not because God needs to make covenants with mankind. I think some people get the idea that God somehow does that because he needs like an accountability partner or something. Whereas if it's like not somebody's not holding them accountable, that somehow he might like fall short and not live up to his word. That certainly is not true whatsoever. Why are these things in here? Why did he do these things for our benefit? for our admonition, not for hers. It is, the plan's already done. He already said it before the foundation of the world. So these are things that are for us. But again, in Nehemiah here, we see that it is a very physical focus on the, the covenant and the promise, that it's about the land and it's about conquering the physical nations. And it wasn't even much of a different mindset, even with the apostles after Christ um, raised from the dead and walked with them for 40 days and taught them. Because in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, I don't have a slide for it here, it says the, the apostles are asking, when they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They still had the focus. Their mind was still set on a physical thing, the same thing that, that the prayer in chapter, Nehemiah chapter 9 had mentioned, hey, we're servants in our own land. I mean, this was supposed to be our land. We messed up. We sinned. You took us out like you said you would do. And now we're back in here and we're servants in our own land. And we're not reaping the benefits that you, you that we could have had we been more faithful. So the the apostles here are having the same mind. It's like, hey, so is it finally going to happen? Are we going to finally get this back, the kingdom back? And, of course, Christ goes on to say, he says, and he never says, well, yeah, you'll get it back eventually. He said, he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. We see through a glass darkly, and so did they. So let's take a look at the covenant that was made with Abraham through the lens of the New Testament. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. 
So the gospel was preached to Abraham. And what was the gospel? What was the good news? Was it about a physical kingdom, a land that they were going to come back in? Well, not according to what Paul is talking about here. No. Let's look at Acts chapter 3, verses 25 through 26. Ye are, ye are the children of the prophets and of, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And Paul in Galatians 3.29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So again, through the lens of the New Testament, the covenant with, that God made with Abraham that we read about in Nehemiah chapter 9 had much, much more to do, and it had a far broader and greater impact on humanity than just the idea that the physical nation of Israel was going to get a land and they were going to be able to have it. And what does it say? What was the blessing to Abraham? It was Jesus Christ came to him. And he says here in Acts 3, Peter says that, it was a great blessing for Israel because he came to them first. He came to Israel first. He came through them, and he came to them first. And why did he come to them? Not to give them the kingdom again, but he came to bless them and turning away every one of them from their iniquities. And he also goes on to say here in, in Galatians uh, 3.29 that it's for the whole world. It's not just for the physical nation of Israel, but anybody who is of the faith of Abraham. So not only is the, the promise that we see a glimpse of in Nehemiah chapter 9 not about just the physical land, but it's not really about conquering physical nations either. And Ken's done a sermon a couple times um, about these here, but the the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Gergesites. I don't think I've ever met any of those people. I don't know, to be honest with you. I couldn't pick them out of a lineup. I don't know, but I don't have any need to cast any of them out whatsoever. But I certainly have things that needed to be cast out of me. I don't think that I had any demonic um, possession, but nonetheless, I certainly had my mind warped and twisted by my sinful life. And so not only are we given the promise of eternal life through Christ Jesus and the blessing through Abraham, but also in this life here, we're promised that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in Romans 6.22, but now being made free from sin and become <laughs> servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. And one more verse, 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're freed from sin. We're freed from the dominion. We're free from the thing that really held us captive. Our own minds, our own disposition, contrary to God and towards sin and towards destruction. That we are freed from that. So the glimpse that we see in, ne in the prayer in Nehemiah is only a small part of the real blessing of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So again... If you, look at, if you look only in the Old Testament or try to sort out what the gospel is from the Old Testament alone, you will certainly miss many things. Nehemiah 9, verses 13 and 14. You came down also upon Mount Sinai and spake with them from heaven and gave them right judgments, true laws, good statutes and commandments, and made known unto them thy holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses, thy servant. That certainly happened. You can read about that in Exodus 20. It definitely happened. It was a great occurrence. And in fact, that has never happened before or since that God has spoken to an entire nation and pull the people like that out for himself, not in the physical sense. And even more so, we read here as Moses recounts to the next generation what had happened in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. We see here, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And skipping down to verse 25 of that same chapter, it says here, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. So again, if you just take, and there are many other verses that have the same tenor, and Israel was given a nation, which is a whole different thing than what the church is. The church is not a nation. <laughs> the church is his body. The church is a collection of believers. We do not have any, any governmental authority. It's not. We don't have a nation. This was the nation of Israel, and they were given a set of national laws to obey. But if you read through the Old Testament, you will get this idea over and over again that if you want to be righteous, you must observe this law. That It says right there, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments. It says it right there. I mean, that's just about as plain as you can get. It shall be our righteousness. And that, that's essentially what was said in Nehemiah chapter 9 in those verses we just read, verses 13 and 14. Good laws. He gave us, you know, commandments, everything to observe, to keep, and he certainly did. We read here in Micah, and this maybe, from our point of view, looking back, sheds a little more light on it, but it doesn't change it from if you stand on the point of Deuteronomy and look forward to Micah, this essentially just reiterates the same thing. In Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we read here, Wherewithal shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? It's a rhetorical question. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. So again, from the point of view of Deuteronomy, that this is our righteousness to observe all these commandments, this just reiterates that and maybe steps it up a notch, but it doesn't change it. This does not change that paradigm, that mindset, that, that I must keep the commandments and its statutes and its judgments to be able to be righteous before him. However, let's take a look here at one more prophet's interpretation of this. And then we'll take a look back through the lens of the New Testament and see what's really going on here. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 24. So this picks up right after we read earlier, where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. This is the next verse. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. So Isaiah here is saying, it's in the Lord that I have my righteousness and strength. So from the lens of Deuteronomy, that means, well, yes, duh, he gave me his commandment, so my righteousness comes from. So it's in the Lord, i.e. slash, I keep his commandments, and that's where my righteousness comes from. That is definitely the lens of the Old Testament. However, let's take a look at what Paul says here. First, Philippians 4.13, um, Isaiah 45 talks about strength, righteousness, and strength. Paul tells us here, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So it is, my, it is through Christ that gives me strength. And then let's take a look at the other points here where it says, in the Lord have I righteousness. What does Paul say in Philippians chapter 3 again? Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. And he just gave the whole list of essentially keeping the Torah and being very diligent and zealous about it. But what things were to gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, i.e. Deuteronomy 6.25, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Which is what Isaiah said, but from the point of view of the readers in Isaiah's time, they would not have understood this in the fullness that we now do. Because in sundry times, he's dealt with men differently. And in these days, he's dealt with us through his son. Let's take a look back in Isaiah 45, verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. 
Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In John chapter 3 verses 14 through 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So if you read in the Old Testament in Numbers, where the fiery serpents were killing people, and God instructed Moses to make the brazen serpent and hold it up, and then whoever looked on it, you could never look forward from that point and understand what does that mean? But from this point, looking backwards, we can see the deeper meaning of it. And actually, even in John 3, it has two, because when the Son of Man be lifted up, is talking about when he was nailed to that cross. And it also is being lifted up as being the man that people look to for salvation. So it even has a dual meaning. But again, the, the New Testament gives us the only lens through which we can look back on the Old Testament and understand the unfolding plan of God for mankind. And again, I want to emphasize that this does not mean that the prophets of old dropped the ball and they missed it or they were stupid or lame. It has nothing to do with that. They were faithful men who had done and were doing what God wanted them to do. You're right. They didn't figure out the New Testament from trial and error. Yes, correct. Let's see here. Another another point in, in, in reality, if you get rid of the New Testament, which means you get rid of Messiah, and if you, from the Old Testament, even hold the point of view that there will be a coming Messiah, regardless, the Old Testament provides absolutely no provision for a walk with God without animal sacrifice. There isn't. They, 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 the rabbis have come up with this, this thing because they lost the temple and they can't do sacrifice, so they've come up with this whole mishmash of, of things that they do. But in reality, there's only one, there's only one way that men can be right with God, and, and that's that their sins be forgiven by blood. So if you don't have a temple to kill animals with, you have no sacrifice and you have no hope. There's no way that you can get around that. And so what happened is the men to whom Christ came, most of them missed him, and they lost their opportunity for sacrifice. They rejected him. That's why many people today mourn the idea that the temple doesn't exist. They have the Wailing Wall. I mean, this, you know, everybody, everybody's heard of the Wailing Wall. Whether they understand what's going on there or not, nonetheless, they've heard of the Wailing Wall. And why do they mourn? Because they realize inside they missed the one. They missed the real, the real sacrifice. And why did they do it? Because of their doctrine, because they thought they knew what was next in God's plan. They thought they knew how things should look, i.e., certainly when Messiah comes, he is going to give us the kingdom back. And certainly when Messiah comes, he is going to extol our religious leaders because we know what we're doing and we're great. And that didn't happen. Acts 7, verses 35 through 37. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he had showed them wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear. So they rebelled against Moses, and they rebelled against Jesus. And there are many who think they're not rebelling against Jesus, but they say, well, Jesus came here to say the same thing Moses said, so Jesus didn't bring anything new. It's not true at all. He brought a whole new paradigm. And why did they rebel against Moses? Well, because when Moses came on the scene, 
things didn't go the way they expected. Moses came on, and all of a sudden, no more straw to make bricks. All of a sudden, now we have more work to do. All of a sudden, now plagues are coming. This doesn't line up at all within my mind the way things are supposed to be when God comes to deliver me. I don't like it. When he's out in the wilderness, you know, they're going, they just leave Egypt, and and before they even get out of Egypt, they're already being pursued and pressed up against the Red Sea, and they're going to be killed and murdered. They run out of food and water, and they complain. And then they get angels' food from heaven, and they complain about that. What was the reason? And I'm not pointing at them. This dwells within me too, but for the grace of God. But why did they miss it? Why did they reject Moses' authority that God gave him? Because Moses wasn't doing what they thought should happen. They rejected what Scripture said. They rejected what God said. And they made an idol in their own mind about the way they thought things should be. And Moses wasn't matching up with that. So they rejected him. And the same thing happened when Jesus was here. He did not line up with what was in their mind. And what did Paul tell the Corinthians in chapter 10? He says, look, these things are written as examples to you, to us. Take heed if you think you stand, lest you fall. So how many different things? And Brian's uh, message last week about unity is a, was a good one. Um, and, and how many different things do we hold in our own mind that if, if we were back in the day when Christ was here, would we just flat out rejected him because he didn't line up with the way, oh, no, that's not right. That isn't right. It's not the way it's supposed to be because we have this own stuff in our own heart. And how can this happen? When we have the wrong focus. When we make things that aren't as important important and things that are important not important. John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And here's another example where it was where it was done as an example. You don't understand what's going on now, but you will understand. Jesus said that more than once. He says, look, the stuff I'm telling you now, I know you don't understand it now, but you will understand it. When these things unfold, you will understand. And it's the same thing with the Old Testament. We can look down back now at the prayer in Nehemiah chapter 9. We can look back now at Isaiah 45. We can look back now at Deuteronomy chapter 6, Exodus chapter 20. Uh, We can look back at the Old Testament and understand it in a much deeper perspective or or a different lens than they were able to. That doesn't mean that we know everything and we have. We don't. We see through a glass darkly. But we do understand that God has dealt with mankind differently throughout human history. And now he deals with us through his son. So what should our focus be? The son and what he has done. So what made the tabernacle in the wilderness glorious? God dwelt there. That's what it was. And in fact, the, the tabernacle, I always wondered when they, when Solomon finally built, built the temple, what did they like put it in a shed out back or something? What did they do with all that stuff? You know, I don't know what they did with that. I mean, there was all the curtains and everything, all the the boards and stuff. It doesn't mention it anywhere. But what made the and, and the tabernacle, the way the tabernacle was set up, there certainly were were fine implements, gold and brass and everything, but they were all behind curtains. Hardly anybody ever saw them. And the only time you would ever see like the brass laver, for example, or whatever, is if you had sinned. And they had to go give a sacrifice because of your sin. So all the all the fine gold stuff was inside, and only the priests saw that. So there wasn't a showy big fan. There was nothing glorious about it. Right. Yeah, it was. So God accepted Solomon's temple. He he dwelt there. 
he came down on it just as he did the tabernacle. But what made Solomon's temple glorious? Was it that this, the cedars of Lebanon and all the gold from Ophir and everything, was it all that stuff? No, it wasn't. It was the fact that God dwelt there. That's what made it glorious. That's the only thing that made it glorious. That's what made it God's house. I am sure that there were structures, even in the time of Solomon, that were far fancier than, than anything Israel could have made. I mean, that's the thing about the, the pyramids in Egypt. I know things are huge. That's the thing about what they looked like in their, in their glory days. You know, I mean, that's all those, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon and all, all this. I mean, this is, so what made those things glorious? Was it the structure or was it who dwelt there? It was who dwelt there. But if you look at the lens if you try to find the gospel through the lens of the Old Testament, you're going to be stuck with a very physical representation of the glory of God and a very physical representation of the blessings that he offers. And he offers so much more. And he has made that clear through the apostles and prophets in the New Testament. So this whole thing here, this, this idea that, that Christ said this, because what? Because the old temple is torn down and he is the new temple. He and his body, which is the church, we are part of the temple. And not only did they, this here, they twisted his words and they used them to, to crucify him. The false witnesses came and said that he said something about it that he didn't really say, but it was in general. They said, uh, um, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. He didn't say that. And then again, in Mark 15, 29 through 32, once he was hanging on the cross, they mocked him about it. It's like, oh, Mr. Big Shot, you're going to build a temple in three days. You can't even get down off of that stick. They mocked him. They made fun of him for that stuff because they missed it. Why? Because their hearts weren't right, and they had ideas in their own mind about the way things should be. Make sure I got this. So what matters? Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That should be our focus. That should be what we, what our hope is in. Not Our hope isn't in something that is temporal and, and earthly and, and is not going to last. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons and daughters unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. That's what he's doing. He's bringing many sons and daughters to glory. That's what it's about. And how is he doing that? By those sons and daughters turning to him and receiving forgiveness of sins and being filled with his spirit, which Philippians 3.3 3 tells us here, if we are the circ for we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh or any of that earthly stuff. It doesn't mean that there aren't things that we need to do. That doesn't mean that obedience, as we just read in Titus there, zealous of good works, live soberly, get rid of all that stuff. But that's the easy part. Our focus should not be on things that are temporary at best. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 8, 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruit to the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. No longer are we waiting for the time when the kingdom will be restored to Israel. No longer are we waiting for the time when there will be a temple that sacrifices can be performed in. No longer are we waiting for any of that. 
What does all of creation groan and travail and in pain together until now wait for? The adoption and the redemption of the body, the return of Jesus Christ. One more set of verses and a little summary. This clock is wrong. It says it's 12, 12. <laughs> I was like, wait, I only went like two minutes. <laughs> Second Peter chapter three, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's what our hope is. Our hope isn't in some, this is all going to melt. Um, the, the, you know, we are the temple sermon that I did just a few months ago. That's the, the temple in, in Revelation 21, when the New Jerusalem comes down, there's no temple in it. There is no temple. Who's the temple? The Lamb is the temple thereof. There's no more. There's no more animal sacrifice for sin. There's not. It's not going to happen. Yes, yay. Jesus did it. That's finished. That part is done. In sundry time and in diverse manners, he has dealt with man. But now he does it through his son, who is our high priest, and who is our sacrifice. He is our Passover. So. Uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, they did, Abraham, Moses, they did preach the gospel. Those men knew God and walked with God. They were obedient to God, and they will receive their reward at the end of time, as all saints will. Absolutely so. The fact that they did not know, as we just read a few verses to that effect, they did not know everything that God has revealed unto us doesn't mean that they were somehow less than us or less godly. In fact, I think they probably were holier than most. If you read through Hebrews chapter 11, I mean, that's quite a bit, you know, cutting sunder with swords and everything and all tortured and beat. They built that wall in 52 days. They when they got back, I mean, they didn't have modern equipment. They didn't have cranes or nothing or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's just right. They didn't, and they did it with one hand because they had the sword and the other one they had to do it. I mean, it's amazing that it's like so. So what can we learn from Nehemiah chapter nine? Well, the gospel is there, but only if we look at it properly through the lens of the New Testament. There certainly is. I, I think it's a great prayer. It's a wonderful prayer. But we should always be careful to not take that and then try to move a doctrine forward based on what it says there. We should always look to how does the New Testament interpret this? And then how can it be used for our admonition, our, ex, our exhortation, our encouragement, our example? Um, Brian's message again last week really, really hit me, that, that thing about unity. I, there's only God that can pull that off. I don't. I mean, it's not because otherwise, man, if man tries to do it, you're either all sitting in your own closets or or you're in some form of, you know, lowest denominator ecumenism, where it's just like everything goes, and it's like, well, I'm not going to say nothing because it'll stir things up and blah, blah, blah. But God's church is not divided, and his spirit dwells in all his saints. Um, and I think that more than anything else, the, the church people get the, myself included, get the idea that church should look a certain way, sound a certain way, smell a certain way, whatever it might be. Um, that's not true, incense and stuff, you know. So, this is true in a sense that there must be the church must be centered on the work of redemption done on the cross and salvation by faith in Him alone. It will have to have the appearance of holiness. Those who are bearing the fruit of the Spirit, anything else is adding and placing many in the same position most found themselves in in Jesus' time. They didn't know Him, and He didn't know them. And that's the that's we all walk that right now. We got to hold fast to Him. We got to fix our eyes on Jesus. I thought I had that verse in here. Did I have that out of Hebrews? I, he I think I read that earlier. So, fix our eyes on Jesus. He is our focus. He is the one. It's no longer the sacrifices in Jerusalem. It's not the temple anymore. 
It's not he dwells in each and every one of us. He is the focus. He is the one that is the glory. And he is God. And he came here and he died for us to forgive so that we could be forgiven of our sins and be filled with his spirit so that we can have victory now and we can receive eternal life on that final day. So thanks, Nehemiah and Ezra, very much for your for your diligence and your faithful activities. But thank you so much more, Heavenly Father, for sending your son. And thank you, Jesus, for enduring the cross and dying for us, paying for our sins. And it's open to anybody who will just hear his voice and repent and turn unto him. So, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, saints. Have a good rest of the Sabbath. And as uh, 